safe to say you probably wouldn't want those nasty little guys after you. I put their AI together for the VR game I've been developing, where I needed groups of small, stealthy quadrupedal robots that stalk, and then eventually attack the player in vulnerable spots. The idea being to slowly build tension and paranoia. This sort of behavior requires coordinated teamwork on the bot's part, which is orchestrated through a central control script that analyzes tactical information and then dictates actions and outputs parameters for the bots to use. This includes things like setting bot behavior states, attack formation, sightline calculations, and selecting places to hide when following the player. The individual bot scripts have functions that then carry out these behaviors, in addition to functions that are inherited from my NPC base class. Finally, for pathing, the bots use Unity's NavMesh system, which allows for point-to-point -point movement and links between separated areas. With that summary in mind, we can break down how the bot's AI actually works, and the design decisions that led me to the current setup. The foundational component of the bot's design is behavior states, and it's also the first thing that I added to the code. These states are present on both individual bots and the all-important controller script. Both scripts have a state for basic behaviors like idling and point-to-point -point patrol, as well as more advanced activities like stalking and active attacking. Starting with the patrol and stalking states, the bot's AI uses preset points of interest to determine where to walk and hide. Each point object has a position, along with relevant tactical information, including the angle of protection it offers, whether or not it's hidden in foliage, and if it's currently occupied by a bot. Then, when the controller is in the stalk state, it runs a coroutine every second that uses that tactical information to decide for the bots which point they should currently be watching from, and if they should be trailing the player or not. Now this routine is pretty important. So for every bot, it first checks the validity of the current hiding spot. If this hiding spot isn't hidden within some foliage, and the angle to the player is no longer within the angle of protection this current hiding spot covers, it's marked as potentially directly visible by the player. Additionally, if the player is too far away from the hiding point, it's marked as stale. These conditions being true will cause the controller to find a new hiding point, which is a two-step process. First, the list of nodes is ordered, based on ascending distance from the player, and we calculate that distance by getting the square magnitude of the vector between each individual node and the player. So now that we have that newly ordered list, we can evaluate all of the nodes in it for their angle of protection, whether or not they're hidden, and if they're already occupied by a bot. The first point in the ordered list where all of those conditions are met is returned and then subsequently assigned. This ensures that we always get the closest point to the player that's also an acceptable hiding place. The bot's not going to move to the new point immediately though because it doesn't want to be directly seen by the player. And this is where some of the earliest development and inspiration for much of this AI's functionality comes in with look-based behavior. Way back in initial tests, before I had even come up with models or designs, I set up the bots to freeze and wait for the player to look away before entering the attack state. Over time, I built this into the current stalk system. First, bots will only move to new hiding points when the player can't see them and their newly selected hiding point. Second, one of the bots will trail the player's back if it's remained unseen for some amount of time, and, once caught, that bot finds another hiding point. And trailing the player's back is really pretty simple, it's just a matter of the controller signaling one of the bots to walk to a point that's in line with the inverse of the player head's forward vector. On that note, the only case where they'll move in direct sight of the player is if they're already visible and have no other choice. Speaking of visibility, the ability to hide in planters plays a significant role in the bot's ability to maintain stealth. This required two additional considerations. First is making sure the bots can seamlessly step from the floor's nav mesh onto the planters. While Unity's nav mesh system comes with linking functionality, in development, I found pretty quickly that I would need a specialized coroutine that could interpolate between the start and end of links. 
Otherwise, by default, you get this weird and unsightly snapping between the two points. The coroutine that I use for this is based on one written up in pseudocode that I found on the Unity forums, which was a good starting point. From there, I also added the rotation interpolation that's necessary for the design of these bots. The next thing that I implemented in this vein is a foliage disturbance effect. I realized pretty early on that this would be really helpful for atmosphere building and immersion. You can't have creepy stalking bots without rustling foliage. So this is achieved using a C-sharp script that receives trigger messages from the foliage planter and then sends positional information along with intensity over time to its shader. A function in this shader then uses this information to offset vertices with some overlapping sine waves that fall off with distance from the center of the disturbance. Now hiding is great, but at some point there comes a time when the controller needs to tell the bots to just begin attacking the player, and this can happen through a number of different ways. Other than the obvious, like direct attacking and interaction, the bots will become confrontational when the player is most vulnerable. Assessing player vulnerability is done on a per-bot basis, so let's get into how I ended up doing that. For every bot, I get the angle of the player's look direction and a vector from the bot to the player. The value of this angle tells us whether or not the player's back is turned. In addition, we also calculate player distance. If the player is close and their back is turned to the bot, we add one to a counter, and if those conditions aren't met, we remove one. Should this value equal the total length of the bot list, we enter attack mode. Now this works great for encounters on the fly, but it can get in the way of planned sequences. We can't have the bots prematurely attack before the pre-planned confrontational reveal. So there is some consideration in the bot controller for scripted behavior, prime example being the pickup scene from earlier. Here, the bots are prompted to attack only after the player has a proper means of defense. Once the bots actually begin attacking, they'll try to approach from behind, surrounding the player from the back in a circular formation. This is calculated by converting the player's Y rotation angle to radians, and then taking the cosine and sine of the sum of that angle in the bot's index for each axis of the plane of the ground, respectively. Calculating the bot's attack targets this way allows for as many bots as we can fit around the player for a given radius. From here, we also have to consider obstructions in the way of the target attack point. The bots shouldn't try to get behind the player if there is no behind, so we check obstructions by raycasting from the player to the attack point, and if this returns true, then there's an obstruction. In this case, the bots will temporarily use their own local rotation angle in the attack point calculation instead, and this will prevent the bots from trying to get to inaccessible locations. Upon reaching its position in the formation, each bot will close in on the player over some amount of seconds before finally attacking and then retreating back a bit while another bot attacks. We do this by multiplying the attack target position by a value that's decreased with time, and once it reaches a low threshold, our bot will act out its attack sequence and then reset that value back to 1, prompting the retreat. Each attack is essentially a sharp bite from the bot. I also had to take into consideration the player's distance here because we can't have damage being taken from a bite that happens halfway across the room. At any point, the player can attack the bots, and, once enough damage is taken, the bots flip over, glitch out, and then explode. This is done really simply, just by instantiating a separate, physically active copy of the bot model, applying a force pointing away from the player's attack, and then removing the original bot and its AI. This new model has a script that then runs an explosion coroutine which I intended to be an obvious end to the bot's existence, complete with flaming debris. This also adds to the mystique by preventing the player from getting a good long look at their attackers. And that just about wraps up our deep dive into the functionality of these bots. All of this effort is aimed towards adding another unique feeling opponent to the game. 
hiding in foliage, trailing the player's back, and coordinated attacks all work together to make the player feel like they're actively being hunted. What I'm going after here is building suspense and immersion in a way that I think VR as a platform really lends itself to. So thanks for watching this development video, and I hope that it was informative or entertaining. It takes me a while to produce these, so if you like what you see and want future updates on my game development, subscribe to the channel.